So my name is uh, Jerome Oaken. I'm a physical oceanographer, uh, which uh, means I'm studying the physical part of oceanography. And that includes uh, the currents, that includes the waves, the tide, the temperature, and the salinity. The temperature of the ocean and the amount of salt in the ocean, they both decide its density. And the density of the water is not constant throughout the ocean. At the surface, it's different from different places. For example, here in uh, the Sargasso Sea, it's different than in the North Atlantic. And the deeper you go in the ocean, the, the higher the density as well. What interacts with the climate now is at the surface, but what used to interact with the climate or what will interact with the climate are the temperature and salinity at depths below the surface. And to measure these, we actually have to go out and take the ship. On a day-to-day -day basis, I'm usually sitting in front of a computer, but to be able to understand those changes, we need to measure it all the time. And that's what the Atlantic Explorer is doing right now, is it's taking measurement both at the surface and throughout the entire water column to tell us, give us more data about the various layers in the ocean. Almost every month, the ship goes out and takes those measurements. So when we look at temperature and salinity, for example, it represents a really large amount of data. Uh, to give you an idea, the temperature and the salinity are measured 48 times a second as the rosette, our probe, descends into the ocean. So to really visualize what those density changes can do to the ocean, we can do very simple experiment in a tank. You'll need four clear plastic tanks or aquaria, a sheet of plastic to divide one of the tanks into sections, lots of fresh water and seawater, or some salt to mix into the fresh water to turn it into seawater, some different colored food dyes, an ice cube tray and freezer, and finally, something to weigh the ice cubes down with. We use metal gauze and a pipe cleaner. First of all, make plenty of different colored ice cubes overnight using the food dye. Next, fill the four tanks as follows. One with fresh water from the tap, one with seawater, one with equal amounts fresh and seawater all mixed together, and one with stratified water. Fill this one with fresh water to begin with, then use the plastic divider to section off a third of the tank. Pour a cup full of salt into this section and mix it in. Then add some food dye to this seawater and gently mix it in as well. Very, very gently pull the plastic divider out of the tank. The clear tap water should settle on top of your colored seawater. Finally, leave all the tanks to warm up to room temperature. Once the water has warmed up, put two ice cubes into each tank, one on the surface and one on the bottom, weighed down with the metal galls. And watch what happens to the food dye as the ice cubes begin to melt. If we let that little ice cube float in fresh water, the little ice cube will melt. The colored melt water will be cold and fresh and we'll try to interact with fresh water that is warmer around it. The colored cold water will be denser because of its temperature than the surrounding water. And that's why you see those filaments of dyed water sink to the bottom of the tank. If we put that colored ice cube in seawater, the water from the ice cube melts. That water is fresh and cold. And it has to interact with water that is salty and warmer. In our case, if we take the Sargasso Sea water, the amount of salt in the Sargasso Sea makes the water so heavy that even if the melt water from the ice cube is colder, the water from the ice cube is still lighter than the Sargasso Sea water. And that's why you see that in that case, as opposed to the freshwater case, the melt water from the ice cube will stay at the surface and float on top of the Sargasso Sea water. And then those are the two extreme cases, but if you mix that water and come up with a water that has a lower salinity, then you can find a place where the amount of salt and the amount of temperature can compensate each other. We had a, a tank filled with mix, a mixture of salt water and fresh water, and we could tell this by putting a, a dyed ice cube in the bottom and the top of the tank. And we saw that the, the dye mixed up evenly throughout the water because the density was the same. Our tank was composed of salt water and fresh water. It was stratified so that the fresh water was floating on top of the salt water. When we put our ice cubes in and the food coloring melted out, it formed a distinct third layer 
This is because the cold water from the ice cubes was more dense than the room temperature water that formed the top layer, but it wasn't quite as dense as the salt water which formed the bottom layer. And those changes in density actually lead to what we call the thermohaline circulation, that is a giant conveyor belt that takes water from one place, and those currents move the water at the surface of the ocean. And in some places, that water sinks to the bottom of the ocean, and then within the ocean, travels back to where it started. So that whole cycle can last anywhere between 1,000 to 2,000 years, and it defines where the properties of the ocean are carried, whether they are the pollutants, whether it's a, a temperature signal that will affect the climate, all those properties are carried away by those very large-scale currents, and those large-scale currents are driven by density differences. It's very important because the ocean is a major part of the climate system. Uh, you can view the climate system as the interaction between the ocean, the atmosphere, and the land. So we need to understand, for example, what's happening at the surface of the ocean in terms of evaporation and temperature, because it has very strong interactions with the climate, and that will decide what the climate was and where the climate will go in the future.